Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, how you doing? Welcome into the program. Uh, we hope that you're doing well today and you are ready to go. Uh, waiting oh so patiently in, uh, in the waiting room is, of course, our guest today. Uh, if you haven't heard, today's guest is going to be OWC, Other World Computing. They, of course, run the website Mac Sales, and they put out a number of fantastic products. And, you know, uh, we saw them out at CES this year. Uh, they, they, you know, they continue to innovate. They had some amazing hard drives and things like that that they're always known for. But then, of course, uh, some more in, let's say, the gaming sector as well. So uh, here to talk to us uh, all about OWC, what it is that they're doing and more, is the president of the company, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, second part of the program will be computer and technology news. We'll be talking about things such as uh, Signal launching their face blurring uh, application, which shouldn't be too hard. Uh, we've seen a combat drone who's going to take on a human pilot in um, 2021, July 2021, uh, as a you know kind of a test to see if automation uh, in... Uh, and fighter jets is all it's cracked up to be. So all that and more, second part of the program. And hey, if you miss any part of the show or you want to check out uh, our guest website or check out any articles that we talk about, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything. You'll find reviews, show notes, products, past shows, future shows, podcasts, videos, archives, and more. Everything that you need to know about Computer America will be at the website. Find us on social media at ComputerAmerica.com, or I'm sorry, at Computer America on all social media channels. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. So we're just going to go ahead and get started with, uh, hey, get started with the show. And hopefully uh, we'll be good to go here in just a moment. So we're going to admit Jen here, and hopefully this all goes well. Uh, looks like there's a couple people here. But uh, yeah, we'll figure this out. So welcome onto the program. As I said before, uh, Miss Jen, Su uh, Jen Sule, or Jennifer Sule, she is the president of OWC and very happy to have her. Let's see if this works. Fingers crossed. And uh, Jen, welcome on to Computer America. How you doing? Hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to try uh, one other thing here and hopefully this works. And uh, Jen, is that you? It is. It is. It is. Oh, 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 I'm not going. Oh. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. One second. Um, okay. Um, uh, you can do either one. Just pick one for sure. All right, perfect. And hey, you sound oh, you sound perfect. And uh, you know, people don't know this, but uh, before the show, I spent like an hour and a half making sure the audio here in the studio was perfect, and then that happened. But hey, you sound great. Uh, I'm happy to have you on, and I'm really happy that you could be here. Um, so let's go ahead and start at the beginning. Uh, first of all, how you doing? Second of all, uh, tell us about uh, yourself, OWC, and um, yeah, just a bit of background on on both of those. Oh, sure. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. Uh, my name is Jen Sule. I'm the president of uh, Other World Computing, also known as OWC. So gosh, we do all kinds of things, but uh, really we make uh, your computing investment kind of last longer and do more. So that's through SSDs, memory, uh, docs, external storage, you, you name it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course you've been doing that for uh, you know for a number of years, and I think that a lot of people who I think kind of specialize in Macs obviously will know of your products more. But uh, you know, lately you you've been uh, putting out products that are you know kind of platform agnostic. It's you know PC Mac doesn't matter. Uh, it's all about I guess the quality. 
Yeah, that's really what we've always focused on from the beginning is really that um, it, it's got to last, right? If you're if you need it in a crunch, and a lot of our customers are um, media and entertainment professionals, or they're on the road, you know, cutting or performing to live audiences every day, or cutting an album, it just needs to work. So that's always been our focus. I gotcha, gotcha. So uh, obviously, there's been uh, there's been a pandemic. I'm sure, Jen, you know this. Really? I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I know, and, and I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that our audience is is, um, you know, very acutely aware of how companies are trying their best to navigate, you know, the almost entire workforces working from home that just a couple of months ago had to come into the office every single day. Uh, I've read an article somewhere saying that uh, I think it was analysts expected 10 years of, you know, kind of growth, uh, you know, telecommuting and, and uh, online commerce, e-commerce, things like that. Uh, 10 years of e-commerce expected growth got squished into about three months. Uh, it, it, it's been a rapid, rapid change. And it's, it's it's been very interesting to see companies, you know, try to keep up with this. Uh, so I have to ask, how is, o, how is OWC uh, doing this? Because, you know, you're manufacturing as well as e-commerce. Yeah, I, I really think we're doing pretty well. I've been really proud of how the teams pulled together. I, I think like everybody, you know, we have our challenges individually, certainly from a psychological stress management standpoint. But from a company standpoint, uh, our, certainly our products very much lend themselves to work from home. So we've definitely seen, you know, a big bump up in people buying used Macs, buying docs, you know, buying connectivity devices so that they can get to work at home. So and and that's pretty interesting because you're obviously on the providing the hardware side so people can work from home and you're seeing people I guess uh, and I'm sure that you you know better than I do but uh, I'm sure a lot of people for the first time ever had to see you know oh what does a good webcam look like or what is a good microphone that I can you know use with these services uh, where have been some of the uh, you know some of the more active sectors of um, of I guess consumers buying uh, lately. Sure. Uh, for us, I mean, definitely, like I said, we're seeing it on um, people need those machines, right? They need the machine to work uh, or they need an additional, you know, monitor. They need a keyboard. They need a mouse. So some of it's that bread and butter stuff that you just need that you might not have had at home. Uh, and also, obviously, a lot of people aren't going places and they have time to do gaming. So we're certainly seeing, you know, increases in people buying more memory, more SSDs, you know, things that will really enhance their gaming experience. Yeah, we're definitely uh, we're definitely going to uh, touch on gaming here in just a moment, but to keep it on the productivity side, the work side, uh, work before play as always, uh, mostly. We and I, I do want to say that uh, when it comes to productivity and being able to you know kind of continue what people do, uh, what what ha what are some of the products that you think people should know about or they know about and they're starting to you know really get into it because I think that uh, you know when it came to productivity and working away from an office space uh, to a lot of people that just meant a laptop or even their smartphone and just being able to do that. But oh, and something I, that I've noticed lately is that more and more people are, um, you know, they're, they're building actual workstations. They're building actual workspaces in their homes and they're getting even more productive, uh, unlike they were, I guess, kind of before if they had a home office. Yeah. And I would say, you know, I'm a good example, right? Because I would certainly work a lot from home, but yeah, I would just use my laptop, my laptop screen, because I'm doing it for an hour here and there, or I'd use my phone because it's, you know, predominantly email based. My, a lot of my communications are teams. I had the teams app, but for me, obviously doing it, you know, eight, 10, however many hours a day, uh, you definitely need a nicer environment. And for me, the, the key was really just expanding on my screen real estate, which mm -hmm. is what I, so for me, the big productivity piece is really a doc, whether it's a travel doc or a full size doc, depending what you need, that makes it a lot easier, especially on uh, those Macs that only have like USB-C or Thunderbolt ports. Uh, you know, you take a doc and then it's real easy to connect a keyboard, a mouse, additional monitors. And that's what I found was, just made setting up um, a better workstation at home a lot easier. 
Yeah, the uh, docs, I think, are one of those things that people, um, you know, don't really consider all that often. But I, I guess especially with uh, with Macs in particular, I know that I think uh, the latest Mac uh, laptops have, say, one or two, if you're lucky, uh, you, you know, USB-C, you know, kind of ports. And I guess that's where the dock comes in is you can have plenty of information flowing through, but you can only connect one, you know, one item at a time. So with an OWC dock or, you know, really any, uh, you know, a dock, you can have up to how many peripherals, like uh, how, how productive can people get with just one dock? Uh, is it one additional device, three, four? Oh, pretty darn productive. So on our travel dock, you can basically plug in a keyboard, a mouse and another monitor, right? And so you get, you get, it's uh, you also have an SD card reader, which may or may not be needed by everybody. But so you kind of have your basics. The four, I mean, we have a 14 port dock, which obviously allows you to connect 14 things. So, you know, that gets you uh, an ethernet port. It gets you a lot more uh, USB ports. So it, it just depends a little bit what you need. Yeah, I, and, and I gotta say that um, you know we, we actually did a review of an OWC uh, uh, external hard drive, and that's actually what we still continue to back up the show to uh, every single day. But yeah, that that external hard drive, um, yeah, it, it, hey, one of those things that could be included in a dock. I, I think uh, when it comes to hard drive space and being able to, you know, not just work from home, but being able to go to you know different places and take your work with you on those external hard drives. Uh, it's, it's, uh, very, very valuable. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We have a number of different, uh, portable storage devices that can bust power right off the laptop. So yeah, it definitely frees you up. Yeah. Uh, it was the elite pro, although, uh, you know, I see that you've upgraded to 16 terabytes at this time. Uh, you know, back when we I'll did always it. Always get was, bigger. <laughs> uh, yeah, no kidding. And, and of course, just a super compact. And it's always, it's, it's always been crazy what what OD, what OWC has been able to uh, you know to really accomplish over some of its competitors. So, in terms of productivity, you have these all listed here on your website if people want to take a look. Um, and I do want to talk real quick that you know we've been talking about laptops, but I saw here if you go to you know, uh, maxsales.com. But if you go down here, you also have like these smaller mini stacks, these, uh, these smaller form factor computers. I think that's something that people aren't that familiar with because, you know, desktops, they get laptops, they get, uh, these kind of mini PCs, these, um, you know, the, these mini stacks, these really, um, and those are hard drives, but like these smaller form factor computers, have you seen any kind of uh, increased interest in, you know, just not, not just like a smaller computer, like a laptop, but like a smaller form factor altogether? Oh, sure. I mean, one of the things we certainly sell incredibly well and can usually not keep in stock are uh, we, we do a lot of uh, re resale of refurbished uh, Apple, Mac, uh, Apple Mac computers. Mm -hmm. So the Mac mini is huge you know we have uh, and actually it goes really well some of them with that mini stack uh right right on top of each other if you're kind of constrained on space you know a lot of people live in apartments or you know might not have a dedicated office they can really work in so uh certainly the small form factor has been uh, a big driver for a number of people I, I certainly believe it so and with that being said many people are working remotely i know that uh, you know going into the office is a no-no but at the same time uh it's been months people are getting stir crazy uh okay. you know it i i'm sure that you can speak to that too but um yeah you know, being able to go out and even with restaurants at 50 percent capacity you know being able to go out to let's say a starbucks and you know sit out there uh being able to take their work with them when it comes to OWC and helping people work from home, but of course work remotely, uh, we, we've talked a little bit about docs. We talked about some of these small form factor PCs, uh, but are there any other products that you can kind of say that, you know, this made my job working from home a lot more comfortable, easier, efficient. Actually, you kind of have it right up there on the screen. And it's, it's one of those things that might not be the sexiest thing, but um, replacing the battery. A lot of people, they're, you know, because they're normally tethered, uh, they, they're, they forget really how maybe degraded their battery has been. So we've actually been selling a ton of batteries because people are trying to go a little bit more remote or maybe enjoy working on their patio or, you know, wherever they can, like you said, now that some of the restaurants are opening up in different states. So actually the batteries have really been a big one for people so that they can get that, you know, multi-hour um, away from a power, power supply. 
Yeah, the the battery and uh, Apple doesn't have the best track record with uh, you know replacing batteries and things like that. I gotta say though, when it comes to a laptop, it it might be one of the easiest things to uh, to actually replace next to let's say a stick of RAM or something like that. But uh, the the battery, I, I I one thing I wanted to point out was that I've been trying to do this here uh, at the studio. We have a, like a bunch of different monitors that I still have sitting around because recycling e-waste, recycling electronics, uh, that's a topic that's been on the show often. And I've reported enough about e-waste that I feel too guilty to just throw it in the garbage and call it a day. Uh, you have to dispose of it responsibly. You have to send it somewhere or, you know, uh, send it somewhere that it's going to be recycled efficiently and it costs a little bit of money and it's definitely inconvenient. You have tried to tackle that because obviously if people are replacing their batteries, they're going to have a not so useful battery sitting around. Uh, you have this one where you ship it back and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the customers ship the old battery back to you and then you deal with it. Yep. Yeah. Cause I mean, basically we've, we've shipped them something in a, in a, in an approved container, you know, that, that has all the appropriate packaging material with it. So you just basically take, take the new one out, install it, put the old one back in it, ship it back to us. And we take care of uh, making sure that it gets, gets disposed of correctly. I got you. So, um, so a listener in the chat room wanted to know also, because this fits kind of the motif that we've been uh, pushing so far with the working from home space. And, um, I see here that, you know, you were, you were selling, uh, you know, headphones, you know, really high end, uh, mm -hmm. beats, home pod, that kind of thing, uh, headphones and speakers and things like that. But the other part I mentioned a little bit ago, webcams, uh, how is, how is, uh, does OWC sell webcams and how has, uh, yeah. What is your lineup of webcams? Actually, you know, we don't really focus tremendously on webcams, so it's not been, uh, you know, particularly big mover for us. We have a few, but it's it's not an area that's it's pretty well saturated, I'll yeah. say. So yeah, we don't. It's not an area that we you. focus. On. We pretty much sold what we had, and that was that was about it. Oh yeah, I, and and I definitely understand that. And I guess a lot of uh, you know, if you specialize in refurbished MacBooks and things like that, many laptops out there have built-in web cameras that right. are they're actually pretty decent. Yeah. So, but hey, you know, uh, the it's always something that you can jump back into. I assume that if you felt it, it was right and you felt it was good, then hey, you oh, can always jump sure. back into it. Yes, for sure. So with uh, so. Okay, so all that, and with people, people being home, you mentioned this a little bit ago, uh, there's been a surge in gaming. And I will say that looking at um, you know a lot of the metrics out there, video gaming has never been more popular. Uh, it's, it, people are, I'm sure they're all doing their work as best they can and as efficiently as they can, but hey, the allure of, well, video games being ever present, uh, it, it, it's been fun. It's been fun. Let's say that. So when it comes to gamers and when it comes to playing video games, uh, some of the different products here, we've been talking about productivity, taking work on the go, making sure you get it done. But when it's time to clock out and you still have, you know, this really nice computer that you're now doing a lot of work on, you can now play video games on. What are some of the uh, key products that you think that kind of enable gamers to get more out of what they have? Oh, sure. I mean, on the, well, I'll go on the console side because certainly with a couple of kids, I'm very familiar with that. But uh, that really for, uh, I don't know, for anybody that's familiar with games these days, they take up a tremendous amount of space. So a super easy thing to do is take an external hard drive, plug it in and your you know, 500 or maybe a terabyte, maybe two terabytes if you have a newer machine can become, you know, eight terabytes or even more. So uh, that's an easy one. Uh, one to really boost performance would be an external SSD. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I wouldn't even mess with the internal drive. It actually, in some cases, can be slower. You just plug an external drive in and you get an instant boost. I mean, you can, you know, reload after death, you know, launching the game to begin with, all these things that are important. I mean, you can do them so much faster. So that those are big ones. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was about to say anything with a loading screen. If you're playing a video game, uh, those loading screens get cut dr dramatically. When you're right, you have an SSD, oh, yeah. and uh, you know we've been hearing a lot of talk about you know the next generation of Xbox and PlayStation. They're going to have SSDs kind of standard. Uh, though this is something that I actually recall talking to uh, you know to your reps out at at uh, at CES about. Um, when it comes to hard drives, though, 
not all hard drives are the same. Like it's not just about SSD versus HDD. It's not just about uh, capacity. There's, and this is something that you know I was like to draw attention to, which is the speed, the the read. Uh, I'm sorry, the read write speed uh, that these hard drives have. You know, some people look at two hard drives and they go, uh, and, and they go, this one's a hundred dollars, this one's two hundred dollars for the same space. What a rip off that two hundred dollar one is. But no, uh, you know, read write speed has a lot to do with the performance and the benefits you get. Uh, when it comes to OWC, uh, I'm 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 still assuming that a lot of your hard drives still kind of push the the higher end of the read write speed and the efficiency. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, you. What's the point of, you know, having Thunderbolt or having, you know, you a, a Gen 2 USB port and not making use of it, right? So, yeah, we, we definitely, when we're uh, developing our external storage solutions, we're always looking at how can we maximize the bandwidth that's there, either through, you know, the amount of lanes uh, that we may have if something is internal, making sure that you're not going to be bottlenecked by right. any PC drive that you buy. Yeah, it's and and of course all these things, uh, you know, kind of like I mentioned, next generation consoles are going to come standard with it. Although some of the uh, you know some of the read write speeds are on the lower end, but I gotta say that current generation consoles can benefit from it today. You just have to know oh, what to do, yeah. and and how to do it. And, and really, it's it's not really all that difficult. It's you know, like you said, just kind of connect it with a USB port. It's, yeah. it's not hard. <laughs> no. So and, and of course with uh, and, and of course with that. Um, and you, know. you can, and the same upgrades really, SSDs obviously apply also on the, on the you know, laptop or a desktop as well. You know, if, you, if your computer doesn't have one or doesn't have a large enough one, adding that can make a big difference. For sure, for sure. And, and of course, uh, one of the latest technologies to hit SSDs, and I know that they're, you know, also available in your products as well, is the, oh, yeah. uh, the, the, the NVMe, uh, mm -hmm. you know, style of storage, much faster, much, uh, much lower profile and design. Like it's, uh, uh, smaller form factor. Oh it's, yeah, it's awesome. It's tiny. I mean, you, if you say pocket sized, it really is pocket sized. It looks a lot like a stick of RAM, but it's uh, multiple terabytes worth of uh, oh, yeah. worth of memory. Uh, yeah, Incredibly worth storage. Impressive. There we go. Yeah. Very impressive. So with uh, yeah, and of course, you know, if you're watching the video portion here, uh, again, you can go out to uh, maxsales.com check this out. But we're showing up on the screen tons and tons of different options, everything from uh, you know, really even like we've been talking kind of about consumers, but you serve everything up to kind of small medium business. You know, you have solutions here okay. ranging from you know USB sticks for you know twenty bucks something like that, all the way up to you know thirteen hundred dollar you know, uh, was 128 terabyte storage base. Yeah. I mean, that's practically limitless, right? I mean, well, I'm sure actually the high end M&E guys can definitely fill that space, but yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. So all that and more, uh, let's see. So memory drives, docs, Thunderbolt, uh, and, and Thunderbolt technology is, uh, you know, certainly getting more popular. And of course, when it comes to the Apple arena, it's, um, uh, it, it, it certainly pushes the bounds as far as speed goes. Uh, there will be some changes, I believe, uh, coming up here soon. You know, uh, Thunderbolt technology is here to stay, but at the same time, they're transitioning as well over to USB, um, uh, USB C 3.1 or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, and they're kind of blending the, the technologies. It's, uh, it's really cool to see. I'm sure that coming in the coming years, I know that uh, coronavirus has thrown everything up in the air, and I'm sure your roadmap has changed significantly over the past couple of months. But um, you know, kind of looking forward, there's there's still a lot of innovation coming that uh, you know people should be ex excited about, right? Oh, always, yeah. Actually, uh, one of the products that we're really excited about that's coming out is our uh, Thunder Bay Flex Eight. And essentially, it's like the first of its kind. It's going to be, um, you know, an eight-bay storage solution. It's going to be a PCI expansion chassis, and it's a dock, like all rolled into one. So it's like the ultimate, you know, workflow tool. And so I think it's not available yet. It's coming up. But if you did a, if you did a search for Thunder Bay, um, Flex. Flex. Okay. Yes. And and, you, and 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 uh, pardon my ignorance, but that would what would an ideal uh, I guess kind of solution uh, would that kind of replace? Is that someone who maybe like a small medium business IT would definitely want that for their back end? Uh, who 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 is your target audience for that product, the Thunder Bay Flex? 
Sure. I mean, it definitely can be small, medium business. Uh, the target and the market that we've worked a lot with, and I've mentioned a couple of different times, is media and entertainment. Uh, certainly, their demands, uh, you know, this are people making movies, making episodic television. Their demands are very, very high. So the great thing about the Flex 8 is it obviously gives you a ton of capacity. It also um, allows you to install U.2 SSDs, which is kind of an emerging technology uh, they're very, very rugged, very, very fast. And so like if you if you want to pair, say, like our Helios 3S uh, is an expansion chassis, right? So we have this um, interchange system. So you basically put a U.2 drive in there. You can capture from that, drop just the U.2 drive in the um, carrier in the mail because this happens a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and then it goes, you can plug it right into the Flex 8 then for ingest and to start editing and working on um, the footage. So it, it's definitely meant to be that high powered tool that gives uh, certainly creative professionals or anybody with with high demands, everything that they need right there at their fingertips. Yeah, you you definitely just reminded me that, uh, well, first of all, we have a correspondent here on the show on the regular. He's, uh, he's kind of our con computer graphics expert uh, and he works in Hollywood on movies and things like that. And he said lately, uh, obviously with the shift to working from home, uh, it, it, um, sending drives is actually the fastest way to send data because I know people think about gigabit, you know, fiber, fiber optic and that kind of thing. But it was kind of proven that the fastest internet speed out there, you know, when it comes to transfer rate is actually slower than a carrier pigeon. Uh, there, <laughs> there, there, there was, there was an experiment in Australia where they tried to download a giant file over the fiber optic network. And they attached a very, very dense, small uh, USB stick with the same amount of data to a carrier pigeon. And the carrier pigeon got the data to the end destination faster than the downloads. Uh, sending these things in the mail, making sure that they work after some rough handling, um, always important. And I know that OWC has, uh, you know, when it comes to ruggedness, that's been... Um, where other companies might say, hey, you know, it's technology. Be careful with it. OWC, you guys definitely uh, vet vet your suppliers and make sure that everything yeah. will last. Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, like a lot of our customers are, they're in the field. They are pretty hard on their equipment. I mean, certainly they take care of it, but they're, you know, at far flung corners of the world or are it's really cool to see, you know, a lot of our product will be used in live shows, you know, at Madison Square Garden or, you know, certain sporting events that I probably haven't paid the licensing to mention. So I won't. But, you know, that's, <laughs> they have to be rugged and they because that's what makes them reliable. Definitely, definitely. So and, and by the way, thank you for, uh, you know, kind of turning me on to U.2. That's uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's, you know, gone in one ear and out the other. U.2, uh, I've, 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 I'm very familiar with M.2. But you I'm sorry, you dot two is uh, something kind of new to me. So and there's there's that. And, he, you know, obviously, like the press release will include this in the show notes. But, uh, you know, you the Thunder Bay Flex 8 was, you know, kind of right here. The Thunder Bay Flex 8. Um, yep. Is there. And uh, yeah. So I'm going to ask you this now. Uh, you know, we talked about so many different products already. It's uh, it's been almost rapid fire. What else is new with, with OWC? Yeah, no. Uh, um, so that's on the hardware side. On the software side, like imminently within the next, you know, uh, few weeks, we're going to be launching uh, for the first time. Uh, Soft Raid is our flagship uh, software RAID product. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have the first uh, Soft Raid for Windows. So that's really exciting for us that like you had mentioned earlier that, you know, our products are becoming more, you know, platform agnostic. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely an extent extension of that. And then uh, shortly after that will be uh, soft raid six uh, for the Mac side that will incorporate raid six as well. So that's exciting for us. Yeah. And I, and I think I actually found it here as well. And of course, putting things, yep. And, uh, put, putting things into a raid, uh, you can correct me if I have any of this wrong, but of course, uh, it's a matter of, you know, uh, raid zero, which, uh, you know, it's just kind of like everything works, uh, as one giant pool. And then there's like a raid mm -hmm. one. I think that, uh, everything is backed up. Everything's redundant. Uh, you know, if one of your hard drives goes out, that's okay because the other ones have all the data and it's all retrievable. Right, it's uh, a perfect move. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, being able to, uh, you know, like you said, for working professionals, if, if a hard drive fails for whatever reason, they're not, uh, you know, if one of two hard drives goes out, both aren't useless because one did no raid, you know, a raid one, very, very important. But of course, uh, you know, 
hey, uh, having the software, being able to customize your storage solutions is uh, super important. So great to see that's coming to win uh, to Windows finally. Yeah. Very, very cool. Absolutely. Uh, and, and actually speaking of, uh, you know, speaking of some accolades, we have a note here uh, saying that the American Business Awards and a Video Edge Best in Show Awards, uh, these were awarded to you not too long ago. Uh, talk, uh, would you talk about that real quick? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, actually, we've talked a little bit about the Thunder Bay Flex 8, which is the one that got the Video Edge honor. So that was... Uh, it was really awesome. We obviously all would have much rather been on site at NAB interacting with people face to face, but it was it was definitely nice to be honored for that. And then for the um, American Business Awards, we got a gold for a Thunder Bay 4 Mini. So that's essentially a more portable version of our full size Thunder Bay. So it's four two and a half inch. It's a you know four two and a half inch uh, drive bays. It's mm -hmm. Thunderbolt three has that soft raid with it. So you get the capacity and the performance. And like I said, the more portable size, uh, we also want a gold for the Mercury elite pro dock. So that's sort of a nice combo where you get two, three and a half inch drive bays, and then you also get a docking solution. So a um, little bit of best of both worlds there. And then the bronze we won for the uh, OWC Excelsior 4M2. So that's our fastest SSD. We made it specifically for the new Mac Pro, but of course it works on the PC side and it works on the older Mac Pros. And that thing can go like 6,000 megabytes a second. So pretty awesome. That that is super super fast and uh yeah lo loading screens be damned i think you uh you, you've <laughs> nailed that um so all this and of course it sounds like hey um working in working in technology working with you know working with these businesses uh even though i know that everyone's you know kind of held up in their home and they're doing their part they're you know being responsible they're staying home as best they can uh a lot of industries aren't uh, they aren't stopping they're just shifting how, how they're working and you know kind of making do like i said way at the beginning they're squeezing 10 years worth of you know kind of uh, the shift to the cloud and shift to you know with all these hard drives you know their own clouds uh, they're squeezing that into a couple of months, rapid change, rapid innovation. And it's great to see OWC, um, you know, providing these solutions for people. So, uh, it's been a little while since we heard from you guys, been a little while since OWC has been on the show, but I got to say it's been a lot of fun and, uh, long overdue. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Ben. Our pleasure, our pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, again, if you'd like to find out more, maxsales.com. And of course, we'll have a link to it in the show notes over at computeramerica.com. Everyone, we've been talking to Miss Jennifer Sule. She is the uh, president over at OWC. And Jen, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, thanks, Ben. Have a great weekend. Have a great one. Bye-bye. And everyone, Bye. we're going to go ahead and continue on with computer and technology news. And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and end it there. So everyone, uh, yeah, we have tons of different topics. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, hey, we hope that you're doing well and you are ready for uh, computer and technology news. So here we go. Computer and technology news brought to you by Computer America. <music> So everyone, hey, uh, deep breath. It's Friday, we're relaxing, and hey, we're gonna have fun with it. Now it's time to move on to computer and technology news. Tons of different topics and tons of different stuff that we can talk about. Uh, I think the first one that we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, something lighthearted, something uh, that that uh, spreads positivity. Check this one out here. This is going to be for uh, ISPs. It's a topic that if you, go way back it used to be hugely controversial but of course now it's like oh whatever isps have data caps uh, most of them are so high that the average user probably won't hit them if you stream a lot of video if you watch a lot of netflix if you share a lot of data if you are trying to work from home and you have to send like we were talking about with our guests these you know these huge files then maybe downloading and uploading tons of information and i'm talking like uh in some cases one terabyte two terabytes a month which really uh, sounds like a lot until you start living from home, spending all your time at home, all of your uh, fun things are at home. You start butting up against those caps all the time. And well, a lot of ISPs out there have been saying that ever since the coronavirus and the pandemic, uh, people have been or they've been reducing their or, you know, kind of increasing the caps uh, so that people can use more data or removing them altogether. 
So here is a little bit of a hopeful side when it comes to small ISPs uh, and it, uh, Antietam, Antietam Broadband says that they will cancel their cap altogether. Comcast AT only wave caps through June 30th. So of course that's going to uh, potentially become an issue again here in a couple of weeks. But just to give you the broad strokes of this, a cap, a, a data cap, as much like a cell phone cap, although not at all like a cell phone cap, if you download, let, let's say you pay for two, uh, two ter uh, I'm sorry, two gigs a month uh, for your cell phone, and you go over that two gigs, they will throttle you heavily, or they will charge you even more money to use even more data on your phone. It's, um, you know, it's certainly one of those things that uh, people run into all the times on their phone, and the ISPs out there will certainly latch on to that idea, the same idea as a cell phone, and say, you know, the same idea applies to your home internet. You're using too much. Uh, there's only so much internet that can go around. And hey, we're going to throttle or limit the top 1%, the top 5%, whatever it is that they feel like they need to limit. And hey, like I said, it doesn't affect 95% of you, but the 5% that it does, it becomes a huge hassle. And the problem is, the problem is what we just found out with Antietam and what they're finding. They put these caps in so that the few wouldn't push out the masses. You know, one, one, uh, one person using too much internet would, you know, degrade the quality for everyone else. But what they found was with everyone staying home, everyone using more internet, everyone just really, you know, to a much greater extent using the internet more than they ever have before, they found that, you know what, these caps weren't really doing anything. And so here's a quote here from, from the, uh, you know, from Antietam president saying that these are uncertain times. We felt the need to give customers as much certainty over their bill as possible in eliminating data usage caps means that customers will know exactly the amount of their broadband bill every single month. Uh, they said that they have been uh, using more internet at home since mid-March, and they said that since the pandemic began, we have seen as much increase in broadband usage as we generally would see over the course of a year. And they said that uh, they've responded to the, grow, uh, to the growing usage by adding backhaul server capacity and local nodes. So they've been really... Uh, expanding the network capabilities rather than tamping down on everyone else and saying, you know what, you just get less internet. Uh, you know, we're not going to invest in our infrastructure. We're going to use, you know, you're just going to use less internet. And that, at least for a small ISP, is a great thing to see. Uh, the large ISPs are not so for are, are not so forgiving. The Comcast of the world, the AT and T's, the um, you know the the charters, what whoever your uh, internet provider is, they have been you know again they took it off for the end of June thirtieth, but after that, they have not made any promises to extend the holidays. Now here's the thing. And I'm sure that, you know, I would have to take some kind of massive poll to really get the true answer from our audience. But I got to say, I have not been seeing any reports that the internet quality on like a national level, on a much higher level, I haven't heard anything saying that the internet has become unusable. Uh, it's become slow, degraded, uh, a lot of packet drop, packet loss, um, high latency, things like that, that were promised if data caps were not implemented. That hasn't happened. So there you go. Uh, obviously, ISPs enforce data caps primarily to boost revenue rather than manage congestion, which is what I'm getting at. Uh, Comcast says it imposes a data cap to ensure fairness amongst customers, but does not impose the data cap in the Northeast United States, where Comcast faces strong competition from Verizon's uncapped fiber to the home Fios service. That's really the thing. A lot of these ISPs don't face competition and hey, if they can get away with data, if they can get away with data caps, if you don't have an option to go away from one of these companies that does impose a data cap, one little way to earn a little bit more money and in some cases a lot more money. 
So there you go. It's uh, data caps have been dropped temporarily. A number of um, his uh, wow. The only way I've ever seen fiber is eating a salad. Very well put. <laughs> and 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 sadly, uh, you know, just to speak to that point real quick. Uh, a lot of you out there might have heard of fiber internet. Uh, Google Fiber is, of course, probably one of the most well-known because uh, they did a huge kind of advertising campaign and, uh, you know, they were vetting which cities that they would bring it to. Fiber is one gigabit per second up and one gigabit per second download speed. Incredibly fast. Most ISPs, I think the national average has been risen, or I'm sorry, has risen to 40%, I want to say. Uh, wow, 240 percent. That makes absolutely no sense. 240 megabytes per second download. And I think it's somewhere like 12 megabits per second upload speed. Uh, most people don't have fiber. And unfortunately, even those who don't have fiber, you still might run into data caps at some point. So there you go. Um, I think that a lot of people are going to see uh, fiber indeed. But hey, I think they said the same thing about DSL, and I think most people have access to cable now. Don't get me wrong, there are still places in the country that still use dial-up over uh, copper wires, you know, over copper landlines. Um, it's not going to be everywhere immediately, but fiber is spreading. It is happening. It's just happening very, very slowly, and I'm sure much slower than a lot of people would like to think. All that being said... ISPs and data caps do not mix. So don't get me wrong about that. It's not necessary. And hey, it is what it is. So with uh, with that being said, and uh, let's see, I have people in actual million dollar homes with 1.5 megabit per second, uh, megabyte per second DSL service. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, and, and, and okay, last thing, and then we'll move on to our next topic. But that's the thing is that these cable companies, they don't want to run lines to individual homes, especially out in rural areas. If you are willing to foot the bill, if you're willing to pay $250,000 for them to run the fiber line out to your home, they'll hook you up that last uh, 10, you know, that, that, that last uh, couple feet. They'll make sure your house is ready to go with fiber cable. They just won't spend the hundreds of thousands of dollars it costs to run that line out to your property. So there you go. Uh, yeah, rural cities. So still some work to do. Let's, because it's Friday, like I said, let's continue on to our next topic. And this one is also fun. Well, fun if you're not afraid of the U.S. military. Check this one out. Combat drone to compete against piloted plane. And for all of you out there that are huge UFO believers, this is the kind of thing that I think UFOs are made of. Uh, I know that, um, you know, we had guests on the show in the past that talked about, uh, actually, talking about the paranormal was actually a pretty big part of what made Computer America Computer America. You know, back in the day, we had uh, correspondents on the regular that uh, would talk about paranormal uh, events all the time, and UFOs were certainly an area of interest to you know to our show. Uh, it certainly has died down in a little bit. Maybe it's just because I'm not paying attention as much. But when it comes to drones, that seems to be what a lot of those UFO events were. Uh, and check this one out. Now we get to see one in the light of day and just how well it works. Because putting a person in a plane. There are still benefits that no matter what you do, how you do it, people in planes are going to make better decisions than computers in a lot of different scenarios. But we all see the writing on the wall. The U.S. military, the Air Force sees the writing on the wall. They know that artificial intelligence controlling unmanned aerial drones is safer for people, safer for the military, more cost effective, and it can lead to some incredible tools that they can utilize. So check this one out. The US Air Force will pit an advanced autonomous aircraft against a piloted plane in a challenge set for 2021. So in just one year, and I think it's July, 2021. They said that the project could eventually lead to unpiloted fighter aircraft that use artificial intelligence, because like I said, that's, that's uh, 
I think the military, I, I, I know that people say that the, that the military is uh, 10 years ahead of the uh, consumer space and, and not even the consumer, but the business space. The military has some of the best funding. They uh, a lot of funding. They have some of the best technology, some of the best minds to be able to work on this. I would say that even they are uh, are not that far ahead when it comes to artificial intelligence, but they're working on it. Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan, head of Pentagon's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, called the test a bold, bold idea. And they also described the development of autonomous fighter jets as a big moonshot for the military. At a briefing organized by the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, they said that they exchanged emails last week with the team leader of the project, Captain Steve Rogers. Really? (laughs) Captain America. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Captain Steve Rogers at the Air Force Research Laboratory. He said that the, uh, the, the AFRL team would attempt to fly an autonomous system to go up against a human man system in some sort of air to air. For those of you who don't know, it's going to be non-lethal. Uh, they currently run these kinds of drills where uh, planes are equipped with, you know, with no bullets, no ammunition, no nothing like that. But the system, you know, they have radars and sensors and infrared, and they'll shoot essentially infrared bullets. And they'll be up in, I'm sorry, and they'll be able to tell if the unmanned aerial drone in a tactical dogfight, you know, infinite space, three directions, three dimensions, uh, someone who is a very, very well trained pilot, if they're capable of going up, or I'm sorry, if the drone is capable against a fully trained pilot, what would happen uh, in a non-lethal setting, but at the same time in a some, some kind of aerial dogfight. So with that being said, uh, Shanahan said at this stage, it, it may not use a lot of AI, but in time, humans and machines working together would make a big difference. They said that when announced in 2018, the project envisioned the development of an unpiloted fighter jet. And he said that, uh, asked by Air Force Magazine whether this was still the objective, he said that he did not know, but added that AI-enabled systems could be used in other ways, saying maybe I shouldn't be thinking about a 65-foot wingspan, maybe it's a small, autonomous swarm swarming capability. Such, swarm drones air, uh, such swarms of drone aircraft could be deployed under a pilot's control or operate autonomously. A U.S. military project called Skyborg will explore... The, uh, how the pilot of a fighter jet can, can be used to control the aircraft, uh, which can be used as uh, sidekicks. It's interesting because that is a space that consumers should be very familiar with. The 2016 Olympics, that or, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, the 2018 Winter Olympics, there was that display from Intel that used, I think it was like 64 or 128 drones to put on uh, an aerial light show. Uh, we've seen a number of places that didn't want to use fireworks uh, use drone swarms instead of fireworks to put on light, you know, light shows and light displays. And you know, up until now, it's been like you know, kind of people dancing in midair. It's been light shows that simulate, let's say, a waving American flag, things like that. Uh, drone swarms can be used in a military setting, and it's kind of funny because that is like the the predecessor technology, you know, being able to make a giant light cube in the air uh, is the the first baby step into an intelligent swarming mass of drones and what it is that they could do. So they said that Mr. Uh, so uh, e- earlier this year, Elon Musk also entered the discussion. Of course he did. Elon Musk crazy, uh, telling the audience at a military conference in Orlando, Florida, that the fighter jet era has passed. He said that the F-35 fighter jets competition should be a drone, remotely controlled by humans with maneuvers augmented by autonomy. The F-35 would have no chance against it, and, well, now we're going to find out. The only benefit that you have uh, right now when it comes to artificial intelligence and a drone that wouldn't be controlled by another person is the fact that, of course, you don't have the limitations of a human fighter pilot. Uh... Human pilots have to go through rigorous training. They they have to know the limitations of their own bodies when it comes to G-force, turning, things like that. Many UFO stories, 
that seems to be the uh, the common thread among UFO uh, conspiracy theorists is that they say, oh, this um, this you know this plane couldn't have been piloted by a person because these G forces would crush their bones and things like that. Uh, yes, Battle of the Planets, you know, uh, being able to turn like that, it would be like 50 G-forces, and it would crush their skulls, and uh, all the blood would rush to the back of their brain, and they'd pass out immediately, things like that. Uh, and a a drone-controlled autonomous device that had no human limitations would be able to make much more immediate stops, much more immediate accelerations, turning, uh, banking, things like that. So... It is the future. I don't think there's anyone arguing that the future of the military, aircraft, things like that, are drones. I think it's a question of how advanced are we? And I'm not really... There's a lot to consider. I don't really believe that the military is all that far ahead when it comes to artificial intelligence, decision-making, things like that. Uh in this space. I think the consumer space is just as far as, as the military would be. So there you go. And Hey, Lockheed Martin or, uh, any of these other indes- you know, military contracting services want to come on the show and talk about where you're at, uh, open invitation, Bennett computer, America.com. Go ahead and email me and we'll get you on the show and talk about that. So there you go. I uh, hope you enjoyed that one. Let's go ahead and, uh, see what we can talk. Yeah. No warp drive. Let's go ahead and see what we can talk about next. Uh, lots of different articles that we can talk about. Um, this is also one. I think that most people at this point, they're very, I'm sorry. They are very familiar with an Apple watch. And here's a bit of good news. Check this one out. A gentleman was actually, well, he was rescued when he was found unresponsive, not by a person, but by an Apple Watch. Apple Watch called 911 when uh, when a Chandler man was left unresponsive. This happened in Phoenix, uh, a lot of retirement communities in Phoenix, Arizona. So a great place to use the the technology. They said that the technology around your wrist could play a role in a matter of life or death. On April 23rd, so this was published uh, June 5th, so just today, but they're referencing a case that happened a couple of months ago. They received a 911 call from a computer enhanced voice indicating an Apple Watch user has fallen and was not responding. The voice provided near exact latitude and longitudinal coordinates of the man's location to first responders. So it's not even just like a street address that is registered to the phone. It used its GPS enabled coordinates and actually got them directly to uh, to the watch, you know, and obviously the person wearing the watch and not just uh, the address on file. Uh, they said that patrol officers uh, were dispatched to the location. They found a man wearing an Apple Watch had fainted and collapsed, saying that he would never have been able to provide us with his location or information on what's going on. He wasn't even aware that any help was coming until we were already there. Uh, if an Apple Watch Series 4 or later detects a hard fall while the user is wearing the watch, it taps the person on the wrist, sounds an alarm, and displays an alert, and that's according to the Apple website. The user can choose to contact emergency services or dismiss the alerts by pressing on a button. And of course, if nothing happens, if a person falls roughly and they don't respond for about a minute, then the watch will automatically call 911 and ask for assistance. Uh, The Chandler Police Department encourages owners to do research on smart devices to see what feature and functions the uh, the items are capable of and how they could help in times of emergencies. Now, obviously, a couple things there. Uh, These aren't the cheapest devices. You know, an Apple Watch Series 4 with, uh, you know, not just with... uh, Wi-Fi uh, enabled connections, but in this case, cell connection. So it can make cell phone calls or, you know, tied to your cell phone, but um, also being able to have a GPS. Yeah. uh, Have a GPS enabled as well. You're looking at like a five or $600 investment. Now, obviously when it comes to a, a person's life, this gentleman is very happy that he spent the extra couple hundred dollars to make sure that it worked. But to a lot of people out there, you know, that couple hundred dollars is not an expense that you could just kind of pull out of your pocket, especially if it's, um, 
you know, hey, you're you're in assisted living or things like that. It's uh, it's not the easiest thing to do, and uh, and of course, as uh, you know, as Fort in the chat room rightfully pointed out, all this came together in a perfect constellation of being able to save this gentleman's life. But think about what happens when it's not a life or death situation, but rather just an average Friday night, Saturday night, Tuesday night, any other day of the week. I think a lot of people would look at that technology and potentially see an invasion of privacy, not just uh, a way to protect the elderly or people who fall down or become unconscious. But hey, you have a fully connected, pinpointable uh, tracking device strapped on your wrist, ready to go. So yeah, you got to know what you're getting into. But of course, when it comes to assisted living, living by yourself, things like that, uh, these are the kinds of technologies that I think are only going to become more common. You know, it started with, it started with a life alert. It started with the help. I'm, I've fallen and I can't get up, but this is where it's definitely going to, uh, you know, to kind of end up, it's going to look like an Apple watch. So there you go. Let's, uh, you know, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, talk about this one a little bit. And this is a wider conversation. Um, it has to do with, obviously, a lot of the conversation that's been happening with um, police brutality and racism and things like that. That's something that, you know, Computer America has not really waded into, and we really don't intend to. Computer America should not be a voice for, you know, uh, a platform for that kind of social change. Uh, we encourage it, but at the same time, you know, you don't need Computer America to tell you that racism is bad. It is. And, hey, that's that's as far as we want to take it. But it does open this particular one because I've been playing video games since I was like three or four years old. My first game ever was Warcraft 1. Uh, I have to thank my cousin Chris who put it on my, uh, on my parents' Hewlett Packard uh pc that was running windows 95 and yeah i got to play warcraft one i've been playing video games ever since i was one of the i was one of the first people on xbox live uh thanks to my connections with computer america uh you know when xbox live as a service fully launched uh i was able to you know kind of get in and see how that operated video game video game culture that kind of thing and Hey, Pong console, that's, that's even way further back. But yeah, video game, video game culture, it certainly is a, uh, there's certainly a problem when it comes to racism, sexism, things like that. Uh, it happens all the time. And this article in particular that we're going to throw into the show notes is talking about Valve and Team Fortress 2. Uh, Team Fortress 2 is one of the oldest um, games out there, you know, with one of the longest running communities. So I guess what they're trying to do here is take an example of a well-established community and they still haven't figured out how to manage racist, homophobic, uh, you know, kind of usernames. It happens all the time. And not to point out Valve in particular, because I think it happens, uh, you know, name any video game company that you interact with other people and there are people out there that will try to offend you just because they think it's fun they think it's uh they think it's funny and they will do it just for the shack value they 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 say that it's you know they don't believe it themselves but they'll continue to perpetuate and just really bring down the culture all together so with that being said um Again, not to point out Valve in, 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 in particular, but the gaming population in general, and I know that we're streaming this on Twitch, so people out there will be able to, uh, you know, to, they'll be able to commiserate with me, but they say that, uh, or what I'm saying is that I don't know what the better system is, but just blankets, uh, word, I guess kind of uh, catchers, you know, saying our word filters, name filters, things like that. They're not working. You need something a little bit more intelligent, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, just kind of have everyone be player one, two, three, four and player one, two, three, four. The community needs to survive to some extent, but overall the community does need to uh, eventually, you know, grow up 
They definitely do. Most mods on Twitch are good about slinging that ban hammer, and auto mod goes a long way too. Indeed, uh, the the automated tools have been getting better and better. But even as TF2, Valve, someone who or a company that is so good at managing online communities, even if they can't do it, uh, it's still a problem that needs addressed. So they say that uh, this article wraps up. By saying that if TF2 is supposed to be an escape from everyday grind, the bots are a harsh reality check, but maybe that's exactly what Valve needs, and they're talking about the racist, homophobic bots that are pro uh, very prolific, uh, I'm sorry, very prolific in TF2. So there you go. Everyone, there's music playing in the background. Uh, sorry that was kind of a sour note. I want everyone to have a great weekend. Be ready for more shows next week. Uh, sorry that we missed most of the shows this week. We've been going through some stuff, but hey, it's definitely good. Tech Rob out there, Melter of Snowflakes, Fort, and hey, everyone else out there listening, thank you so much for tuning in. And hey, we'll catch you here next time. Have a great one. Great weekend. Be good out there. Stay safe. Have a good one. Bye, everyone.